Hello everyone, my name is Ben and this is the Uncharted X podcast. This podcast is episode two, uh, in which I'm going to take a deep look at some of the megalithic architecture that we find in South America, particularly in the Peru and Bolivia areas. Uh, There are multiple different styles of architecture that can be observed if you ever go down there and take a look. As usual, this podcast is the audio from one of the videos that I've produced and uploaded to my YouTube channel, which is also called Uncharted X. And if you're looking for more context or detail, or if you're looking to find that video, just go to YouTube, search for Uncharted X, or go to my website, UnchartedX.com, and you can find everything that I've produced put up there. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy episode two. Hello everybody and welcome to Uncharted X. My name is Ben and I'm a long time student and fan of history. I've spent the last several years traveling, filming and interviewing people. A lot of it with my good friend Luke. You might know it's both from the J Productions channel. And this video today is on a topic that I've wanted to get into for some time now. And that is to take a closer look at the magnificent megalithic architecture of Peru, break down what it is, where it came from, and who likely built these incredible achievements of the ancient world. If you take a look on Wikipedia, read any of the mainstream textbooks, or ask any of the certified tour guides, they'll all more or less tell you that the Inca built everything. This claim doesn't really make any sense when you take a close look at the sites. It certainly doesn't match what the Inca themselves said about them, and anyone with an open mind will immediately see for themselves the obvious evidence that there was much more going on in these places likely in times before the Inca even ever emerged as a culture. So stick with me for the next few minutes as I explain why I think the amazing Andean architecture of Peru is much older than we've all been told. and the other countries of South America that form the Andes mountain range are just stunningly beautiful and unique places to visit. But their ancient history is really completely shrouded in mystery. It's somewhat ironic that we know much more about Egypt and other ancient civilizations like the Greeks and the Romans than we do about what happened in South America. And all of these civilizations that we know so well from the Middle East and Europe, they also existed well and truly before even the known cultures of South America emerged. And this is mostly because of the written records that still exist from those times and the fact that the civilizations overlapped a bit. So you had historians from one civilization recording events and people from another civilization. And we have multiple sources for much of the information that's now left to us. This type of thing really doesn't exist when it comes to Peru and much of South America, even though the history of this area is much more recent to us, at least in terms of modern European history. We discovered the so-called New World at the end of the 14th century AD, thousands and thousands of years after the rise and fall of the better-known ancient civilizations. The primary reason for this lack of knowledge about the history of Peru, and indeed much of South America, is that it was mostly all destroyed. And it was destroyed in one of the worst crimes to have ever been committed against humanity. Only a few short decades after Columbus's voyage of discovery, the Spanish conquistadors that descended upon the Incan civilization had effectively stolen or destroyed damn near everything. And they slaughtered huge portions of the people that were living there in horrific fashion. They did all of this in the name of religious zealotry, and they had the priests and the hierarchy of the Catholic Church cheering them on. To the detriment of our entire species, this heinous crime also included the deliberate destruction of mostly all of the artifacts, the records, and certainly any writings that could have shed light on the long history of this part of the world, and the no doubt many chapters of human life that took place in it. From what little that is left to see today, after the destruction that was wrought by the armoured savages and their bloodthirsty god who sailed in on their little wooden boats, It's clear that the cultures, the civilizations that had thrived throughout this region, at least before this destruction, had a history that was both rich and varied. We are left with some oral traditions and legends that are mostly ignored by mainstream academics. We have some written accounts from the few Spanish invaders that eventually grew a conscience, and very few actual relics that point to a much more detailed history than what we're led to believe today. 
we are also left with the remains of some just utterly mind-bending megalithic architecture. Like these gigantic blocks that sit on the top of a mountain at the site of Alante Tambo. Or this, a man-made cave, finished wall and idol that sits at a place called Napahuaca, again halfway up a mountain in the Sacred Valley. All the enigmatic and mysterious Chulpa Towers that reside at Silostani on the edge of Lake Titicaca and the giant blocks that are also on that same site. Or the incredible formed and worked mountains of stone at Kenko. Or the beautiful and sublime megalithic walls that form part of modern day Cusco. And of course, there is Sacsayhuaman, which sits above Cusco in the mountains at 12,000 feet and is made up of a series of just cyclopean blocks all put together into a gigantic structure that just defies your imagination. So all of these sites and all of this architecture is more or less all attributed to the Inca today. Uh, in some cases, they're finding artifacts from the smaller and, I guess, more primitive earlier precursor civilizations like the Wari at some of these sites. But in general, the architecture is attributed to the Inca. So a uh, brief history of the Inca. They first arose from the highlands of Peru and founded their first dynasty around the year 1100 AD, but they didn't really rise to prominence and become the civilization that we all know about until the early parts of the 13th century, so the 1400s. And only around 150 years later, its last stronghold was conquered and destroyed by the Spanish in 1572. They had some precursor civilizations, most notably the Tiwanaku people and Tiwanaku Pumapunku. It's a whole other kettle of fish. I'll be doing another video specifically on that site. In many ways, that site is much more advanced than even the stuff that you can see in Peru. And I also think it's dated quite incorrectly, at least according to orthodoxy. So the Inca themselves don't claim to have built these megalithic sites. For example, when asked who created the massive walls and structures at Sacsayhuaman, the Inca responded that it was their gods, the giants of their past, that overnight created that structure, that they themselves didn't do it, that it just appeared. It's probably also worth mentioning that when I say giants, I don't believe that giants always means literal giants. Giants can mean giants of intellect, giants of capability when used in that language or in those terms it can indicate a reverence for an older culture or for advanced cultures a reverence for your ancestors and their capabilities so in the incan legends and certainly those legends that come from the other south and central american cultures like the tiwanaku people the maya the aztec they all talk of great civilizers of viracocha or wiracocha the plume serpent they talk of these people having high technology that they were bearded they were red-headed they kick-started their cultures and civilizations. They came across the sea in boats that didn't require sails. The ancient South American cultures all also have one thing in common. They all speak of a much longer history that was riddled with cataclysm and the remaking of worlds, the Aztec Ages of the Sun, for example. In fact, this is something that is shared by almost every ancient culture. It's quite hard to find exceptions for it. It was a given in the ancient world that the, the world went through disasters, like massive disasters, and that the, the ancestors of these people lived through them. And that's a funny thing because now, thanks mainly to a lot of new science that's happened in the last 15 or so years, we understand that is exactly what has happened to this planet. And it has happened fairly recently, in particular, at the end of the last ice age, during the transition from the Pleistocene to the current Holocene era. Now, in terms of dates, this was the time from roughly 15,000 years ago to about 10,000 years ago. And again, thanks to this science, we now know that was a time just riddled with massive global cataclysms, huge and very violent episodes of sea level rises in the hundreds of feet. And it was punctuated at the end by a 1,300 year period that is known as the Younger Dryas. The Younger Dryas begins and ends with these two massive global disasters that just caused huge swings in global temperature and global climate. The first of them plunged the world into just a massive cold deep freeze, a return to full Arctic conditions really. 
and the second shocked the world back out of that deep freeze and put our climate onto the same path that we are still on today. Some of this new science now is also showing us that the most likely culprit for these events were cosmic impacts. In other words, when the Earth collides with giant comets or other cosmic bodies, and we're learning that this type of thing happens much more frequently than we once thought that it did. The Comet Research Group, Randall Carlson, Antonio Zamora, there's so much new data out there that is proving the case. They've just found a giant crater in recent weeks under the glacial ice in Greenland that dates specifically back to the Younger Dryas. There is the Burkle Crater event that happened some 5,000 years ago. It was likely responsible for causing the Biblical Flood. I'm planning on doing more focused videos specifically on the climate disasters of our past and how it affected history. I really believe that it was these events of the Younger Dryas and possibly also those that occurred right before it, say for example the Bolling Alarod period, but roughly the time from 15,000 years ago to 10,000 years ago, these events were the ones that ended what was likely a global advanced culture or cultures that lived around the world. And I think these cultures were the people that built the origins, the very core of the sites that we still see today in South America. We see them in Egypt, in Lebanon, in so many other places, Easter Island. We see this megalithic architecture all around the world. So what is evidently clear to anybody that has looked closely at these sites with an open mind or specifically anyone with any construction, engineering or even stonemasonry experience will automatically see is that there are several styles of construction and that these styles all seem to be radically different and that there is much more going on at these sites than you will be told by the tour guides who more or less always tell you that the Inca built everything. This fact has been obvious for some time and there have actually been dedicated researchers and explorers that have been looking at the various aspects and nuances to the ancient Peruvian sites. Jesus Gamara and his father Alfredo have lived and researched in Cusco and the surrounding area for more than 70 years now. I've met Jesus on two occasions, once in 2013 while I was on a tour of the area with Graham Hancock and Brian Forrester, who you can see standing behind Jesus here. And then again, we met up in 2015 when Jesus was kind enough to meet up and talk to us in Cusco. We had a chat in one of our favorite little cafes near the Coricancha. Jesus and his father have published several books on their theories about the real history of the Andes. These books are in Spanish. He does have a good DVD that's in English called The Cosmogony of the Three Worlds. I'd recommend checking that out. Now his books and his theories you might describe as being out there, in particular the theories and proposals around gravity. But what I do think is extremely solid and very well researched and put together is the system that he uses for identification and categorization of the obvious three different styles of masonry that you tend to see on these Peruvian megalithic sites. And in fact, this is a, a system that works on many of the sites all around the world. I think this is extremely important work because once you start looking at these sites and you kind of see these three obvious styles, it's one of those things that you can't unsee it. You start seeing it in all of these sites. So let's get into the details of the architectural styles that you can see on many of the sites across the Andes and indeed around the world. The first style is known as Hanan Pacha and this is considered the oldest style. This is generally characterized by monolithic work in terms of its one piece. It's often massive work and it's formed out of the living rock. It almost looks like the whole mountain itself has been formed. In a lot of places with Hun and Pacha, you will also find vitrified surfaces. And this is a term that uh, Robert Schock has been using as well in his work lately. Vitrified means that it has become shiny or it reflects light. It's almost as if the surface of the rock has become heat treated. Uh, you can see this in lots of Hun and Pacha. Causes for this are, are really unknown. Possible causes can include giant solar flares, lightning storms, cosmic impact, airburst events, those types of things. Giant cataclysms can form this, or maybe it's an unknown chemical process. Hun and Pacha also usually forms the bottom layer of construction on these sites. It's the oldest, it's the core of the sites. If you go from every site, even Machu Picchu, you will see this Hun and Pacha monolithic work forming the center of the sites or the bottom layer of walls and constructions. Typically, it would require very high levels of technology to construct this. Often, Hun and Pacha is made from very hard stone. There is a site in the 
sacred valley called Napahuaca, where you have Han and Pacha constructions made out of bluestone, which is a form of granite. Very, very hard, and difficult to work with copper, even difficult to work with steel. Or another characteristic of Hunan Pacha is that you will typically see it's very heavily eroded or very heavily weathered. It just looks ancient. It just looks far more ancient than the later work that you'll see often on top of it. Just your intuition will tell you that this stuff is tremendously old. Hunan Pacha also appears to have been flowing at some point, almost as if it was molten or like toffee and then was hardened. Sometimes it looks like objects have just been pressed into Hun and Pacha. Indeed, Jesus Gamara shows a demonstration of pushing hard objects into clay or putty and the end result looks almost exactly like the types of things you can see with Hun and Pacha. Also, there seems to be a connection with water on many of these sites. There is just some incredibly intricate carvings that flow over uh, long passages through the rock that were obviously intended for some form of liquid. There's some very good examples of this in the hills around Cusco. This work also seems to be heavily revered and respected by the later forms of masonry. And in fact, if you look closely, you'll often see that Hun and Pacha is protected by the later forms of work. They're surrounded by it. It's, it's almost a gentle touch. There's many examples of this circular protection, but it seems clear that the later styles very much respected and revered the work that was done in this Hun and Pacha style. Hun and Pacha also matches many other ancient sites around the world and typically these are some of the oldest parts of ancient sites that we know about. The best example that I can think of is the subterranean chamber of the Great Pyramid at Giza in Egypt. This, it's fairly well acknowledged that this is probably the original part of that pyramid construction that whoever built the pyramid did so after or they did so on top of this primordial mound and construction down into the depths of the actual living rock. Uh, this video is from a phone video of mine from when I was there in 2015. It also matches, for example, the Temple of the Mound and the Foundation Stone in Jerusalem, the Well of Souls. All of that work looks exactly like Han and Pacha work that you'll see in other places and indeed may well be very ancient. Hence, it's also revered and respected by later cultures, in this case, our culture. The other component or characteristic of Hun and Pacha work is that it often shows signs of just massive destruction. There are just huge areas of this work that have been split apart, that have been destroyed. There are staircases that have been turned upside down. The best example of this is something called the Lazy Stone, which sits just outside the bounds of Saxe Waman. And you can see all of the carvings and all of the work that's been done into that stone. There's upside down staircases. This stone has been split, it's been moved. The legends have it, this is, these are Inca legends, that this stone once formed the gateway to a tunnel system that ran all the way through the hills and indeed down into Cusco. Uh, I got yelled at several times for trying to go over here and film this. It isn't actually part of Saxe Waman, but if you're ever there, if you go over the back part of the park, you will find the Lazy Stone and it's, it's worth a look. It's an astonishing and just massive piece of Hun and Pacha architecture. The next style of construction that is evident in Peru and indeed evident all over the world and it should be one that's very familiar to people that have looked at these sites anywhere is called Uran Pacha and this is really the megalithic style. You can characterize Uran Pacha by its cellular construction or work with generally multiple blocks. It's not one single piece, it's often many, many pieces. Usually it's always of the same type of stone, this type of megalithic work. The builders went to extreme lengths in some cases to always make walls and constructions from a single type of stone. It is, there are different constructions that are made of different types of stones, but in general, in one place, it's always made from one type of stone. This type of megalithic work shows just a, a unbelievable degree of precision. It's a really mind-bending degree of precision for me. It's not something that is easily achieved even today, and this is typically because it's non-linear. You don't have any two blocks that are the same shape and size, and there are pretty much a no straight lines. They're, it's not uniform, yet the blocks fit together so precisely that you can't fit a piece of paper in between them even thousands of years later. It's really a, a challenge to perceive how people did this. In fact, there are places, 
particularly in the streets of Cusco, where you can see how these walls have fallen apart. So you can, you can get a look at the inside surfaces of those blocks in terms of the mating surfaces between stones. And what you find is that those inside surfaces are just incredibly flat and precise, and they have lips on them that I, I honestly don't know how they were formed. If people think that they were carved by hand or by tools, then it, it's a joke. Like, there is absolutely no way this could be done by hand. I don't know the process that formed these walls. It doesn't make any sense to me. The uh, closest thing I can come to, and having talked to a lot of people around the world on this, is that it's almost as if these stones were somehow, their consistency was changed to something like toffee. And then they were pushed into place in gaps between other stones that were set, and then they set in place. That really explains, in to my mind, the best way of forming these types of stones with these incredibly close gaps with the lips that are evident on the edge of them, and the way that non-uniform and non-linear mating surfaces can be created like that. Sometimes there are straight lines, and particularly the Coricantia. They are uh, a little bit different to some of the really wavy shapes that you get. The stuff in the Coricantia is very similar to the work that you would see in Egypt. And in fact, it's so precise that, and you can see where the Spanish have blown it apart in places, you, you, can, you can barely even see the lines and the joins. Not only that, but the stones tend to also be shaped around corners in terms of the corners of the walls are not formed by the joins of stones. The corners of the walls are actually carved into the stones themselves. This, make, this is one of the reasons why they're attributed, these constructions are attributed as being earthquake proof is because there's no linear fault lines such as we would construct today. We would make a form, we would make all these blocks of the same size and we would put a wall up made of identical blocks. That's not how any of this work was done. You also see vitrified surfaces on Uran Pacha. So again, shiny walls versus non-shiny walls as if the surface has somehow been heat treated. The very characteristic knobs and protrusions on a lot of this work, to me, something that makes sense. And I, I don't have an explanation for how this was done. It's not a process that we do, we do today, but imagine these rocks were like toffee at some point and then they set and you, you could almost imagine as they set these knobs and protrusions forming as they set. Again, very, very familiar, very similar to the casing stones on the Menkara pyramid at Giza, the third pyramid, and also they're all made of granite. That lots of stuff around the world also shows these types of knobs and protrusions. They're clearly not for lifting the stones. They're never in the center of gravity. They're not in the right place. If you try to put a rope under them, the stone will flip over. They're not smooth, etc. I don't think they were used for moving these stones. In terms of where these sit on a lot of the Peruvian sites, this is often the middle layer of construction. So it sits on top of the Hanan Pacha work, the older monolithic work. And in some cases you'll see it actually protects it. It's like they form circles around that older work very much as if they're respecting it or revering that work. And then you often see the rough Inca construction on top of that. We'll get to that in a minute. Quite often Uran Pacha and these megalithic work have been quarried, I mean, all around the world for thousands of years these megalithic walls and building blocks have been quarried and used as construction material they are often used in some of the later inca work there are many places where you can see the rough inca work will incorporate a piece of megalithic work or a, or like a basalt stone or something that's come from another wall and it's been used as a lentil or it's been used as a repair to some other part of cusco and clearly, Uran Pacha megalithic work matches many, many other sites around the world. You, we would probably be here all day if we tried to list the similarities, but in particular, there seems to be a commonality between this work and this, the things that we see in Egypt, Easter Island, Lebanon, Baalbek, Malta, the Hypogeum. Lots of megalithic sites around the world seem to follow this same pattern of incredibly precise work. This astonishing degree of precision that shows in this work has been obvious to anybody that has any degree of understanding of construction or stone masonry, including the Spanish. In fact, famous Quechuan Spanish chronicler and writer Gasolazo de la Vega once wrote about Sacsayhuaman, quote, This fortress surpasses the constructions known as the seven wonders of the world. For in the case of a long, broad wall like that of Babylon, or the Colossus of Rhodes, or the Pyramids of Egypt, or the other monuments, one can see clearly how they were executed. They did it by summoning an immense body of workers and accumulating more and more material day by day and year by year. 
They overcame all difficulties by employing human effort over a long period. But it is indeed beyond the power of imagination to understand how these Indians, unacquainted with devices, engines and implements, could have cut, dressed, raised and lowered great rocks, more like lumps of hills than building stones, and set them so exactly in their places. For this reason, and because the Indians were so familiar with demons, the work is attributed to enchantment." End quote. There's something important to consider from the words of Garcilaso de la Vega, in that the Inca were not known to use the tools that you would need to use to make these walls, or indeed to have any capability to move stones, or to shift them, or to quarry them. And something else to think about when you, you look at precise and uh, incredibly beautiful work like this is that it takes a lot of time to develop that capability. You as a stone carver have to spend a lot of time being really crap at being a stone carver before you can get to the level that you know, is attributed to this type of creation. You also need a massive population base and organized agriculture and society in order to support you. Schools have to be developed, guilds have to be developed. You have to spend time doing your craft. You can't be worrying about gathering food, making food, building houses, doing all the things that you would otherwise need to do to survive. Look at our modern world. You know, you don't build everything that's part of your car. Just the tires on the car itself re requires just tremendous specialization and a huge population base in order to support it. The same thing's true in the Inca times. You're also talking about work that is done in really high altitudes. Food doesn't grow that well at high altitudes. It's hard to support large population bases in high altitudes. It's actually quite a stretch to imagine that the Inca built all of these sites and all of this megalithic work within the only few hundreds of years that they had available to them. The Egyptians, even if you say they built everything in Egypt, the dynastic Egyptians had thousands of years to develop all those sites, yet you're talking about similar achievements happening in South America in only a few short decades. Some of the best examples I can think of are things like the 12 Angle Stone, which is in one of the streets in Cusco. It's an incredibly complex piece. It has 12 different sides that have to match perfectly with other stones. Just stunning level of detail. There are also little tiny stones that are often used to interface between gaps and little tiny, tiny details and lips and edges that form the, the mating surfaces between stones, little tiny details that would be incredibly difficult to shape correctly and then match to its neighboring stone. For example, these are some of the details looking up very close at them on the walls of the Coricancha. It's really one of the biggest clues to the fact that some of this construction has been around for a lot longer than the Inca and certainly it was well and truly beyond their capability to do. It's beyond most people's capability to do. The one last thing that I'll say about Uran Pacha is that it also showed and does show in many places signs of just massive destruction. As if a lot of this work is cracked open, stones have been broken, they're littered all over the place. Something happened to these constructions. Something knocked them down affected them, blew them apart in some places. Uh, we don't know what, but my estimational guess would be the cataclysms that happened at the end of the last ice age. The last category of masonry work that you'll see on these sites is known as Ukenpacha, uh, or the third world. This is pretty much the Inca work that actually happened on a lot of these sites. It's very easily identifiable as generally just very rough work. It, it often uses small stones all put together haphazardly. In many cases they'll use forms of mortar, usually a mud mortar. You won't see any vitrified surfaces on this type of work. It's typically made up of any old stone that's laying around. In fact in lots of cases they will use the remnants of megalithic work and while it certainly seems like the Inca did not take apart any megalithic walls. They were very quick to use any of these stones that were laying about that happened after, I guess, previous episodes of destruction. Ukenpacha is always, and in general, the top or the latest layer of construction. Sometimes you'll see megalithic work resting on top of these stones, but it's usually quite obvious that the megalithic work itself has been moved to be put on top of these stones. But usually Ukenpacha is used to actually repair Hananpacha or Uranpacha work. It's very, very prolific, right? It's, it's everywhere. Uh, Armentini Island is absolutely covered in that. All of the terracing that you see across Incan settlements is all typically made of this type of work. Very low technology required to do this. Anybody can do it. Manpower 
breaking up small stones, stacking them up, and then using mortar to achieve a semi-finished surface. And in many cases, the Ukenpacha is actually doing the same thing that the Uranpacha does in terms of showing reverence and respect towards the earlier styles. There's some very, very good examples of this. Machu Picchu, there are walls made out of this Incan style that mimic quite closely some of the much more precise megalithic work that takes the same form. Likewise, at the cave called Napahuaca, you have a just incredible single piece portal and finished wall, yet standing opposite it, you have a very loose work that is clearly there to show some respect and pay homage to the wall on the other side that's made up of you know what would be an entirely different technological set to make it. It's, it does beg the question, if it was one civilization that was capable of making one of those walls, why wouldn't they make that type of wall everywhere? They're clearly capable of it. So in that way, I don't believe that the same civilization made all of these types of work. Some points in conclusion. Firstly, none of this is taking anything away from the Inca. Their civilization was vast, it achieved much, and it is to be respected. It's truly a heritage to be proud of. Now that doesn't mean they didn't inherit parts of it from their own ancestors or from prior cultures, or that there is still a lot of mystery surrounding the true history of this part of the world. I had a nasty encounter with a relatively well-known Peruvian guide and author, Malcu Arabaldo, who insisted that the Inca built everything you see in Peru. All styles were the Inca, and he claimed it was an organic style that incorporated the very poor stonework right next to the colossal megalithic work. When I expressed some of the logical and obvious inconsistencies that are apparent with that theory, I was immediately accused of believing that aliens made everything, or that I was a conspiracy theory idiot, and other such nonsense, as if I had somehow insulted his heritage just by asking some questions. So I don't claim to have all the answers, but I do believe that there is more here than can be explained by the mainstream story. There are obvious different types of construction on these sites. There's obvious erosion and age differences in the materials and clearly vastly different levels of technology have been employed. What happened to the Inca was a great tragedy and it was a tremendous loss for our entire species when all of their records and artifacts were destroyed. It clearly is something that needs more open-minded study, which is what I'm ultimately trying to promote. The bottom line is that there are some real mysteries here, mysteries that can inspire a true sense of wonder in anyone that takes the time to visit this region and study for themselves the spectacular, mind-opening remains of what was an obviously advanced ancient civilization. Thanks for watching.